unsolved mathematics problems how to pack spheres in the 8th and 24th dimensions. Marina Viazowska, École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. On November 9, 1989, I was five years old. The fact that the wall fell peacefully probably had an impact on Ukraine gaining independence just under two years later. Thank you all. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. So let me start with my story. So I was born in Kiev in Ukraine, and maybe this is how I looked on November 9th, 1989. And then I went to school. I realized that math was my favorite subject, and I decided to become a mathematician and to dedicate my life to solving mathematical problems by applying abstract reasoning. And uh, so six years ago, I lived in Berlin, and I was a postdoc in mathematics, and I worked on a sphere packing problem. And so let me tell you a little bit about this problem and its history. Uh, so the problem is uh, intuitively uh, easy. So we have a container, and we have a supply of uh, equal balls. And the question is, how many balls can we pack inside of this container? And this turns to be a very difficult geometric optimization problem. And so we can consider this problem in dimension three, but also in other dimensions. But let's start with easy, easy ones, with dimensions one, two, and three that we all know and love and experience in our everyday life. So in dimension one, an analog of a sphere or rather of a ball is an interval and we can just cover a one-dimensional space which is aligned with uh, non-overlapping equal intervals. And so we can cover 100% of the one-dimensional space with balls. In dimension two, uh, analog of a ball, it's a disk. So you can imagine covering a table with one euro coins. And in dimension two, it's, a, it's an interesting but rather simple Optimization problem, and here we know the answer. The answer is this perfect triangular lattice. And if we put our coins in this way, then they will cover about 90% of the surface. And in dimension three, the sphere packing problem, it's, uh, no, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> known as Kepler conjecture. And we know that we can cover about 74% of uh, three-dimensional space with three-dimensional equal balls. And so this uh, problem was a very famous long open problem. So it was first asked in 17th century and uh, mathematicians like American and British mathematician Thomas Eriot and uh, uh, Czechish and oh, something, German mathematician German Kepler, they wrote uh, famous letters to each other discussing this problem. And uh, actually, uh, already Thomas Harriot, he, uh, he knew what the best solution to the problem is and how we should stack uh, the balls. And what remained for mathematicians to be done is to prove that the improvement is impossible. And so, let, and for then for almost 400 years, we could not find uh, proof. And maybe, so for, for a normal person, this might seem like a trivial issue, so we can do it. So if we can, can we do it better or not? We just tried enough. We could not do better, so case is closed. But for the mathematicians, that's a very difficult thing to do because we really needed to prove that we cannot do better. And so we worked for 400 years <laughs> to, to do that. And so let me just uh, explain you that this is indeed a difficult question. Uh, so let's first look at the simpler version of it. So it's called the problem of kissing, uh, finding kissing number. So this is, one can think of this as a local version of a packing problem. And what the question is, so now we are not trying to pack many, many balls in a, uh, for example, in a big container. What we are trying to do now, we are taking one, for example, one uh, red ball, and we want to surround it by other balls, so that, for example, on the picture, they are 
other balls are blue, and in my container they are white. And so I want to take as many balls as I can so that all white balls, they don't intersect with each other, they can only touch each other, and they have to simultaneously touch the red ball. And the question is, what is the maximum number of these white balls I can take? And so if we look at this two-dimensional version of the problem, then we can see we can put one red coin in the middle and surround it by exactly six other coins. And here it's uh, obvious that nothing better can be done. But in dimension three, three even this local question is difficult uh, because uh, what we can do, we can consider a perfect icosahedron. Icosahedron, it has exactly 12 vertices. And now we put our balls so that their centers are exactly at these vertices. And we put a red ball so it is exactly in the center of our icosahedron. And this way we get 12 blue balls touching one red ball. But, uh, but, but those blue balls, they will not touch each other. And it seems that there will be some space left between them. And so this discussion already happened uh, almost a century later when Isaac Newton, he believed, actually rightfully believed that the right question is, uh, the right answer to this question is 12 balls. Uh, while uh, his opponent uh, thought that the 13th ball is still possible and we can stick the 13th ball into it. And this uh, problem was mathematically resolved only at the end of 19th century. So it, even this local problem, it took a lot of time for mathematicians to develop tools and to, to address it and to finally solve it. And so let me tell you a bit more. So why, let me now play a game with you which can show you that actually uh, geometry is difficult. And so let's uh, construct, consider two different packings of balls. So one of them I will construct in the following way. I will, uh, in both uh, uh, cases, I will construct my packing in layers. So here I take a layer of red balls and I put them in what is the best packing for in dimension two. And now on the top of it, I will put a new layer of balls. I'll just put new white balls into a holes between uh, the balls of previous layer, and, but now you can imagine that all this goes into somehow, into all directions, and not li only limited to the table. And so also I put you know, infinitely many layers in here. So this is one construction. And so here, but here's an, uh, there is another way how I can do the same thing. Uh, not the same, so I can also pack uh, balls in dimension two. In, in dimension three. So now, uh, this time, I choose my base to be a square base. So this is not the best way to pack uh, balls in dimension two, but this method has some advantages because now the holes between the balls are bigger, and so I can put more balls on, on, in my next layer, and also the next layer, it will actually will be closer uh, to the previous one than in this case. So I do it like this. And so now I suggest uh, that we vote which of two cases, which of two constructions is better. So is this construction, is, is this packing denser or is this packing denser? So who believes that the first method is better? And now, who believes that the second method is better? And who believes that they are equally good? <laughs> uh, so I should say to you that they are not just equally good, they are actually geometrically the same. <laughs> and this packing, it is the same as this packing if we just rotate it in a three-dimensional space. So unfortunately, I cannot do it uh, right here because the balls will fall, fall out. And, uh, so to tell you even more why, so, okay, so this is an explanation why are two packings the, the same. So, but I, but I hope if you look closely at the balls, maybe you can see what kind of rotation I have to do. So this is how the, so the, both this uh, packing, it's called the face central cubic lattice. And so we can now, we can color same balls in two different ways. So first we, color them like this diagonally, and now you see resemblance with this construction. And, but here I take exactly the same configuration, but just 
make different coloring, and now I hope you can see resemblance with this construction. And so to tell you even more, so why another reason why is Kepler con conjecture that difficult is that this uh, we, we have not only one great way to pack balls in dimension three, but we have uncountably many equally good ways. And so how it works, so now you see that, for example, if you look at our first construction, so here I put, I have here four holes between my balls, but I can put only three balls on a second layer, and for a fourth one there is no more place left. Or what I could have done, I could have just shifted all my balls and put one ball here, but also these two put here. And so when I'm putting many, many layers one upon each other, I, at each stage I have a choice to make. And these choices, uh, they create for me uncountably many geometrically different packings, which all still have the same density, because all layers are the same, and they're all on the same distance from each other. And so you see that it's kind of, it's, it might be easy to see that something is the best if it is unique, but here we have so many candidates, and they are all the best. And so it tells you the complexity of the problem. And so this pr problem was finally solved by Thomas Hales in 1998. And so this was a really important proof. It also, it was not only good because he solved this 400 years open problem, but it also introduced some new directions and possibilities inside mathematics. So his proof, it was one of the first um, computer-assisted proofs of an important mathematical result. And this started a huge discussion inside of mathematical community. So what is a proof? Should we accept such a computer-assisted proofs? What is the right way to write the, them down? How can we verify them if we cannot verify them line by line as we do it with the usual human written uh, proofs? And so maybe, but now if, so the case was solved by Thomas Hales when I was 13 years old, so why am I here? <laughs> and so what I could do, I, uh, so, so, so I told you the story in dimensions one, two, and three, but as mathematicians, we can go to higher dimensions. And you might wonder, what are these higher dimensions? And so one thing I would like to tell you that for, maybe it's a bit of a disappointment, but uh, the, the approach of mathematician to higher dimensions is completely abstract. So when physicists speak about higher dimensions, they also think of physics, the meaningful physics that should happen in there. And we as a mathematician, we are freed from this burden. We can just say we introduce more coordinates. And if it does not describe anything, it's, it does not upset us. And so why it does not upset us? Because we believe in the value of abstract ideas on their own. And maybe one way to ex explain this to you is to go back to one of my favorite books, the story of Alice in Wonderland. So imagine that we have our usual world where Alice lived before she went through the uh, looking glass. And this is the, the world of real objects, real life that we interact with and act in it every day. And then there is a world of abstract ideas. And as humans, of course, we can think about, about what we have already experienced. But as we go through the, this looking glass, everything changes a little bit. So all objects are kind of similar, but they are also different, as in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a dream of Alice. So we take a concept which we know from our real life, we make it abstract, but then we can still play with it. And we can change it. And uh, the hope is that we can find something new, and this something new still can be related to something back in our real world, which we did not realize before. And so this is what, as a scientist, as mathematicians, we often do. We actually have to go back and forth. We take our, for example, as an as a example with dimensions, we, we know a lot about dimensions one, two, and three from our everyday life, and we know some useful concepts, like concept of distance, concept of angle, concept of parallel lines, and then we are making this abstract trick by just introducing more coordinates to our points, and this is how we get higher dimensional spaces. And now, interesting thing is that with uh, these concepts which we have from everyday life, they st we can still define them in this abstract, wor abstract world of higher dimensional spaces. And there we still have distance, and we have still idea of lines, parallel lines, 
And now a wonder which happens is that this abstract notion, it's, it still can be related to certain things in the real world if we have <coughs> enough imagination. And so, as I told you, I hope I convinced you that now I get right to study sphere packings also in dimension eight. And so this object which I have here, this is a uh, projection of eight-dimensional E8 lattice into a three-dimensional space, or rather of the shortest vectors of E8 lattice into three-dimensional space. And the theorem which I uh, was able to prove is that this E8 packing, it is the densest sphere packing in dimension eight. And so, uh, and so this is a leech lattice, which is a, an object in dimension 24. And here you can see a two-dimensional proje projection of leech lattice in dimension 24. And so working together with my colleagues, we were able to prove this result. And maybe the last thing I would like to say <laughs> is that, uh, of, of course, uh, mathematics has a lot of its... Uh, uh, <laughs> A lot of practical value, but uh, as a pure mathematician, I think we also should uh, go for this uh, open mathematical problems just because we are climbing the Everest of unknown. So thank you very much. <laughs>